So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning in the States. Uh, welcome to our today discussion dedicated to the topic how Central European countries and especially Czechia, Lithuania and Slovakia could contribute to the US democracy agenda and can shape the summit for democracy process. My name is Daniel Hegedus. I serve as fellow for Central Europe, at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And I'm warmly welcoming our today's speakers, Alina Kutsko, who serves as policy director at the Globsec Policy Institute, Pavlina Janebova, the research director of AMO, the Association for International Affairs in Prague, Czechia, and Vitis Jurkonis, the director of Freedom House Vilnius Office, and GMF's uh, own Jonathan Katz, the director for the in-house democracy programs. The democratic image of Central Europe was forged by such powerful symbols of resistance to oppression, like the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, the Prague Spring, Solidarność, or the Baltic Way, and of course, the successful democratization of the Central European countries during the 90s. However, that democratic image suffered a lot over the past decade, from the obvious harsh democratic backsliding of certain Central European countries, and from the slow erosion of democratic norms present throughout a large part of the region. Nevertheless, there also appears to be a kind of democratic reviewal in Central Europe for a while. Governments flirting with populism were voted down, among others in Slovakia and Czechia, and important players in the region started to heavily invest in their democracy credentials. While the Biden administration's democracy agenda and the Summit for Democracy have often received in Western European countries lukewarm reception, the engagement of certain Central and Eastern European countries has been truly astonishing in the summit process. Lithuania, the EU member state that refuses to bend to the parallel pressure and intimidation of the Kremlin and Beijing, hosted one of the few official side events of the summit, which was dedicated to the topic of defending against authoritarianism. Slovakia became an active proponent of media pluralism and anti-corruption in the summit process. And while the new Czech government only entered office in a couple of days before the summit itself, uh, in the meantime, it made obvious that democratic values are ranking high both on its domestic and foreign policy agenda. Can these countries together reinvigorate the wounded democratic image of Central Europe? Does the summit process offer a useful platform to amplify or shape the strong commitment of these governments to democracy? And what is the level of ambition and the strategy of Czechia, Lithuania and, and Slovakia with the participation in the summit process? We will discuss these and further questions with our distinguished speakers. But first, I would like to ask Jonathan Katz uh, to say a couple of introductory words and share with us the US perspective regarding the contribution of, of Central European countries to the Summit for Democracy process. But before I would give the floor to Jonathan, I would like to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that the event is recorded and will be available online at the YouTube channel of, of GMF. And please also feel free to submit your questions to our speakers via the Q&A function or the chat function of Zoom. Over to you, Jonathan. Daniel, thank you. And I think you actually encapsulated uh, a lot of what, um, you know, not only what the summit was about, but also the role of particularly of Lithuania and Slovakia um, in the summit and uh, the lead up to the summit. Uh, of course, now we're, we're in a what is called a year of action. Uh, the Biden administration is still emphasizing uh, this commitment to democracy. We should see a new uh, U.S. national security strategy emphasizing democracy, again, coming out within the next few weeks. So we have this year of action after the first summit took place in December. We'll have a second summit, I think, more likely to take place in 2023 than it is at the end of this year. We'll see if that that time, if my timetable is right. And of course, you know, the United States, this isn't just about democracy uh, that that is being shaped or uh, envisioned by the United States. It's it's shared by partners and allies. Uh, and I think even just the recent challenges with respect to the cri Russia crisis highlights the importance of the both the transatlantic community, the role of values and democracy. And obviously one of the three pillars um, that we were that 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 was in focus at the summit 
that you mentioned, uh, Slovakia, uh, Lithuania focusing on also was, was the, the effort to defend against authoritarianisms, uh, defending against authoritarians. And of course, uh, when you look at what's happening in Belarus, when you're looking at what's taking place in Russia or China, uh, clearly uh, there are some dividing lines. But let me just speak directly to the to the three countries uh, that you mentioned today. One, there was deep appreciation for Slovakia's efforts, not only to look at challenges abroad, but looking at domestic needs. And I think this was really important. The Summit for Democracy was largely about looking inward and then also looking externally. What can countries do to strengthen their democracy, make democracy work for their citizens at home, tackling things including corruption, uh, which is pervasive not only um, in the places that we think they are, but also highlighted in the Panama Papers um, and Paradise Papers that corruption exists in the United States, in Europe. In fact, maybe more often than not, uh, these countries are enablers of corrupt actors. So Slovakia's leading role in combating corruption has been deeply appreciated. Support for investigative journalism, including uh, putting some additional resources and support for investigative journalism is particularly important. Uh, GMF actually uh, completed a, a report with them on investigative journal investigative journalism with support of the government, something that I'm happy to share with this group. Uh, but also they recently signed an MOU with USAID to support, uh, increase support for democracy uh, in Eastern Europe. So I think on that score, very much counting as we look ahead on Slovakia to step up again, provide a leadership role in the year of action and in the next summit for democracy. So I think, just like you said, there's some expectations and hope that uh, that Bratislava will be uh, in the lead. Same thing for uh, Vilnius and for Lithuania. Uh, Daniel Wright, no country has, has punched above its weight in defending against authoritarianism. You're correct, they did host a summit side event um, that the United States was very keen on Lithuania playing a leadership role. Uh, but, but one thing there too, and I know for the Lithuanians, they're not the only country that faces this threat. And we've all seen over the last several weeks, uh, countries banding together in Europe to support Ukraine uh, and to, uh, to address this, this real threat. Uh, the one that I think a lot of people, when President Biden came in early uh, in his term, new term, uh, his first term, that um, a lot of people are concerned that there would be these dividing lines, but I think it's pretty clear right now that those dividing lines exist. Lithuania has played a significant role uh, politically. Um, it has stepped up in terms of its support from bringing in uh, Belarusians or Russians fleeing oppression. This is a government that has really stepped up and a people that are under threat directly. And so I think there's every expectation that Lithuania will continue to play that role. Uh, and of course, Prague. You're, you you put you sort of nailed it on the head. Obviously, a new government coming in. Perhaps a year ago, the United States and Washington wouldn't look necessarily to Prague to be a leading light on on democracy. That that's that's changed. And and when we speak to Czech diplomats, including in Washington, we hear them speak directly about support for democracy, wanting to play a leading role in the year of action and leading up. And I will just say this, and I'll, I'll end here too. Obviously. Um, None of the commitments, and I think the U.S. government, and I'm happy to put it in the chat box, um, just sent out an email two days ago with uh, a link to all the country commitments, written, uh, oral, and audio. Uh, please check those out if you haven't. But one thing that is for certain when you listen to the State Department, the National Security Council in Washington, is civil society plays the role, the key role, in holding governments accountable for commitments um, and that will also include ind independent media, uh, citizens. I, I think that, that you, the U.S. is not going to be the, the, the watchdog um, for you know, making things happen. Um, and they really recognize and value the role of civil society as key to this and citizens. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, from the experts here today who are going to speak to country commitments. Uh, but you are right. There's a lot of uh, there's high expectations. Um, there are concerns about some things in Central Europe, including the upcoming Hungarian election, which, you know, there is real concern about that election being free, fair, transparent. Um, and, and that's not only in Washington. I know that's a concern in Europe as well. And, and when we look at this region in particular, 
you know, uh, and it's not only Hungary, but Poland as well. Um, there have there have been a lot of concerns. The indexes show backsliding and have for several years. So with that said, I, I really look forward to hearing to your great experts today, um, but more to come on the summit. And thank you for the opportunity to join. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for, for these great introductory remarks. And uh, with this, let's start with Lithuania, because with organizing this side event, I think it's it's fair to say that was the, the highest level partner and most active participant uh, among the Central and Eastern European countries uh, with the US. And, and I can just reiterate the words of Jonathan. Barely any Central and Eastern European country has ever punched so above its weight that Lithuania has over the last year. In spite of the mounting pressure from Beijing, Lithuania did not back down from improving its relationship with Taiwan. Democracy and resistance to authoritarian powers became the cornerstones of Lithuanian foreign policy. And, and it also became clear very early last year that Vilnius would be a strategic partner for the US in the summit for democracy process. How do these things add up into a single Lithuanian strategy? And, and what is the main goal and the ambition of Vilnius? with its efforts. Uh, with this, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Uh, thank you for your nice words. Uh, I, I'm very proud of my country. Obviously, Lithuania is celebrating the restoration of its independence today. So, so another uh, aspect to celebrate. But generally, if um, we talk about the summit for democracy. I think that, uh, well, Lithuania is excited and I'm talking about the people who do the foreign affairs at the political establishment, but also civil society and generally the people. And I think that uh, there's more and more understanding, not only Lithuania, but in the entire region that democracy is of critical importance uh, and that we shouldn't be taking it for granted. I think that um, for the last uh, decade or so, there has been a little bit of the fatigue, you know, that, well, you know, we can focus on other things, but the democracy is there, is going to stay. Or um, if we talk about the, our Eastern neighborhood, there was a little bit of the thinking that the, there's no demand for democracy, you know, that with the Baltic countries, we reach the end and there's no public de demand for things like human rights and fundamental freedoms. And I think that was a fundamentally wrong approach showing uh, that uh, our radar uh, in terms of uh, societies in the neighboring countries uh, wa was um, bad. Uh, and, uh, and what happened in 2020 in Belarus, um, I think, changed the perception uh, here, but also elsewhere, that in fact, there is a demand for democracy uh, and uh, justice, uh, uh, transparency and things like that. Uh, and uh, that's why the Summit for Democracy uh, is of not only an opportunity, but essential thing to reboot the international system. In fact, uh, you mentioned Lithuanian MFA together with its partners organized a high level forum on defending against the authoritarianism and called this forum Future of Democracy organized in late November last year. Uh, and I wanna say that discussions are nice, they need to happen, but I think that if we talk about the ambition, it's much more important what Lithuania is doing and, uh, and was doing. Uh, um, so, so you mentioned a couple of examples. Usually Lithuania is mentioned because of its support to Belarusian and Russian Democrats, representatives of civil society, independent media. Uh, it became a home uh, for a temporary home at least for those who are fleeing the repressions. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you mentioned it, uh, the like unexpected thing, the, the, the entire story around the Taiwan's representation and uh, Beijing's pressure on the time in Lithuania on that. Though we had elements of that before with the, by inviting and hosting Dalai Lama in Lithuania. So it's not necessarily entirely new thing. Um, again, uh, if we look a little bit back to say 2008, 
Lithuania was very vocal blocking the EU and Kremlin's cooperation even before war in Georgia happened. And uh, there were countries which were labeling Lithuania as the last remaining Cold War warrior. Uh, and, and we felt utterly alone back then. Uh, so there's some progress uh, and understanding uh, that uh, what's happening is much broader issue, not only geopolitics, uh, not only about Kremlin, uh, but but uh, that basically it's a clash between uh, democratic systems and, and, and authoritarian countries. And after the Georgia, like war in Georgia, Crimean annexation happened. And again, I think that Lithuania was among those like uh, staunch supporters of uh, Ukrainian civil society. And um, uh, Jonathan mentioned the erosion of democracy, which, well, Freedom House data shows uh, that it's happening for the more than a decade already, and that it's not only an issue for the transit countries, but also for uh, previously the democratic countries, which were almost like leading by example, uh, Hungary was mentioned there, right? So, so I think that we need to, uh, by talking about democracy and human rights uh, um, in our neighborhood, we also need to make sure of the quality of democracy at home. And uh, with this, um, I believe that Lithuania has an ambition to build a coalition of frontline democracies uh, mm, with leading by example, which is not always easy. I mean, none of the democracies are perfect and we need to constantly work on our deficiencies at home, but at the same time, uh, be very vocal and active about human rights and democracy in our neighborhood. Uh, and uh, that shouldn't be, uh, and make no mistake, when people are, uh, some of the um, pragmatists are saying, well, we cannot interfere into domestic uh, affairs. Uh, and I think that the Belarus example is a perfect one. Initially, when people were, when certain politicians were rather cautious about what's happening there, about their statements or sanctions, uh, they were saying, let's not interfere into domestic uh, affairs. Gradually, we've seen that domestic, like the human rights abuse, uh, restrictions uh, to various freedoms, they are becoming a regional problem, not only a threat to Belarusian people with torture, killings of the protesters, but also like with the migrant crisis when uh, Lukashenko was inviting uh, migrants from the Middle East, uh, like uh, countries basically to a trap uh, and we've seen what happened so so with the downing of the Ryanair flight uh, so so human rights violations at home if ignored uh, they become a security issue in the region if not if not globally so I think that Lithuania has an ambition to reboot reinvigorate re-energize uh, those who have confidence in democracy, uh, boosting the energy into the community of democracies. And, uh, and uh, I think that we need to stress that it's not only a philosophical, political or expert type of debate. Uh, yes, politicians tend to talk with politicians, opposition, but there's so much more that needs to be done in terms of cross-border and cross-institutional cooperation. Um, well, it's really a very practical endeavor and we need to use the wisdom and knowledge of practitioners, human rights defenders, independent uh, journalists at risk, civil society representatives, anti-corruption activists, uh, uh, and as uh, uh, it was said before, we need to be also very honest at home uh, and with our colleagues in the region regarding quality of democracy. 
Uh, and I think we had that experience uh, talking to Misha Saakashvili in 2008, 2009, 10. I think we could have been much more honest. Friends need to be sometimes very direct. If we see deficiencies, see it, not play any, let's say it, not only um, play some geopolitical games. Um, so so uh, I think we are getting there. Lithuania is getting there to bring back human rights, democracy, and fundamental freedoms at the front of our foreign affairs make it a priority, not a priority number seven or number six, but a number one. Uh, make sure that debates on national security always include aspects of human rights, because the world with the unaccounted money and cynical, brutal power, uh, uh, like when these aspects dominate, it's really a very dangerous uh, world for, uh, for small countries like us and a very comfortable world for authoritarian countries. So we need much more confidence in democracy. And I hope that Lithuania is providing a bit of that uh, by, and also leading by example in this regard. And I'm very happy to see other countries also uh, be more vocal, providing assistance to the Democrats in the region uh, and uh, this idea of the Summit for Democracy uh, and hope that it will have also some practical consequences in the international affairs and the way how international system is functioning. Thank you. Thank you so much it is for helping us to understand uh, the Lithuanian position. Uh, and I'm Pretty sure that we will revert back to a couple of questions you, you mentioned uh, during your introduction. Alina, we already mentioned uh, what, what sort of agenda setting role Slovakia uh, has played, especially at the field of media freedom and, and anti corruption. Um, what was the main motivation of the Slovakian government to contribute in, in such an engaged and, and active manner to the Summit for Democracy process? And, and how has it played out in the domestic political arena? Over to you, Alina. Thank you so much, Daniel, Jonathan, and Gemma for organizing this session. I will indeed try to explain why Slovakia sees the summit as a very important avenue to promote the democratic agenda and how it perceives its domestic situation and the situation in the region. Of course, like many other countries, Slovakia finds itself in a very contested environment. This contestation is happening at the geopolitical level, and uh, Vitis has already talked about it a little bit, and it's everywhere about around Slovakia. Especially given what's going on in the east of its borders, Slovakia feels uh, on the front lines again, and this is not a very comfortable feeling. But Slovakia also knows that it has a lot of troubles at home. The concept of what counts as democracy is increasingly contested by its citizens, and so is the notion whether democracy is delivering or not. So Summit for Democracy is seen as an important opportunity to both highlight the country's achievements, because there are quite a lot of them, but also increase the chances to stabilize democratic developments at home and in the broader region. Slovakia is definitely motivated to get the best out of this entire process. To start maybe on a lighter note, I was actually going through the written commitments of countries and Jonathan very helpfully sent the link. And I was open in different countries. And I opened, for example, Austria, four bullet points. I opened Finland, it's like four pages, Latvia, one page. And then I opened Slovakia, 11 pages. And I was like, wow. Of course, this is not to say that the number of pages is important for the process, but uh, I just wanted to use it maybe a little bit uh, in a symbolic manner to indicate that Slovakia actually did go through a serious domestic process. There was a lot of rounds of intergovernmental, uh, interdepartmental, interagency consultations to put together the priorities for Slovakia and to make sure that they're clearly spelled out. And also what's also important, especially in comparison how other countries approached uh, this effort, and thank you, Jonathan, for emphasizing is. It, Slovakia was very brave in highlighting its domestic commitments and its domestic imperfections. It's not to be taken in a way that Slovakia thinks it's worse than other countries, quite the opposite. 
it was just decided to be bold and be honest about the work that we need to do at home, but also how Slovakia can contribute abroad. Why Slovakia is so motivated? Historically, of course, the United States have been very important for the democratic transition of the country. We know that the United States is not a guarantor of democracy, neither in the region nor in Slovakia domestically, but Slovakia knows that it is much better off with the United States engaged and supporting democracy in the region than with the United States that is indifferent. It knows that it is a small country with institutions that have not had too much time in historical terms to mature. And it knows that it alone, it can hardly withstand the counter democratic forces, both at home and abroad. Somehow paradoxically, maybe, Slovakia is committed to utilizing this platform that is facilitated by the United States also because domestically in Slovakia, public opinion about the United States is not particularly straightforward. A uh, part of it, of course, is Trump legacy, but also the situation is much more complex than that. We do annual opinion polls at BOPSEC, and I'll just cite a couple of numbers to illustrate the situation. For example, if we ask Slovaks who is the most important strategic partner for them, be it Russia, United States, or maybe China, 17% of Slovaks say that it's the United States, and 47% say that it's Russia, which is a rather um, puzzling statement for a country that's been part of NATO, that's been part of the European Union for quite a few years already. Part of this is history, of course, but part of it is the disinformation and the political contestation that is happening in the country, but also that is coming from abroad. But there is a high level of confusion, not just about the United States and Slovakia, but also about the very concept of democracy and what it means. If we ask people whether they like democracy and whether they think it's the best for their country, about 85% would say, yes, we want democracy as the system that would rule the country. But at the same time, if you ask the people, don't you think that maybe a strong leader who doesn't have to bother about elections or parliament is good for the country? 38% would say, yes, it's a good idea, which is, again, quite a high number for a country that's been part of the democratic processes and democratic organizations for quite some time. And of course, the situation in the region is not really helping. It's making it even more confusing for the citizens to understand what exactly is democracy. If you look at Hungary, a lot of Hungarians would probably confidently say that, uh, yes, we vote for Orban, but we do think that this is a democracy. So there are certain difficulties with communicating with people what we mean exactly when we mean democracy and what specific consequences for their daily life it has. But despite all the troubles at home and in the region, Slovakia also knows that it has a momentum. Of course, they know that the momentum will not last forever, so they're trying to capitalize on all the favorable preconditions that are available right now. If we're talking about the momentum, what exactly it means? First, we have a pro-democratic, pro-Western government in power right now. This is not to be taken for granted. And there is never a guarantee that the next government will be similar to the current one. Importantly, the current government won the elections on a strong anti-corruption mandate. So the citizens openly know that anti-corruption is a priority and they want the government to deal with it. President of the country and the government have like-minded worldview, which is again, is not always the case in Slovakia or in some other countries as well. Democratic agenda is also a personal ambition of President Chapotova. She is highly respected domestically and internationally and is a perfect spokesperson and the leader for the cause. Free media still exists in the country. Again, this is not to be taken for granted. And this free media does help a lot with the promotion of the democratic, democratic ideas in the country, but also in other countries as well. Slovakia also knows that there is a momentum in the region. We talked a little bit about the new Czech government. Slovakia um, is delighted that the new Czech government is very alike in spirits. Jointly with the uh, Czech neighbor, it's much easier to have a different opinion about certain issues than that of their bigger neighbor, like Hungary or Poland. 
So there is a lot of hope for the potential of cooperation with the Czech government on the democratic agenda as well. And of course, all these factors together, they create a feeling in Slovakia that it's pretty much now or never. And hence, Slovakia is actively seeking all the opportunities it can find to support and promote the democratic aspirations. Of course, Slovakia cares a lot about the good image of the region in general. Slovaks remember that once they were the black hole, as labeled by the US Secretary of State, and there is little desire to become again the black hole of Europe, uh, maybe now collectively as part of the region. So, so Slovakia really wants to be this positive story that uh, uh, not just showcases its achievement, but that also brings the entire region forward. Uh, so, uh, in general, the Summit for Democracy is seen as a very useful platform for the region. Of course, you can advertise your own achievements, but importantly, you can also find allies in the region or in also other parts of the world that can work on the same agenda with you. It helps to bolster the image of democracy in general. Uh, right now, doubters are much louder uh, and so they're taking the entire event with, and the Slovak government knows that they need to do much better in terms of communicating the priorities and what it means to be a democracy. In terms of the Slovak commitments, uh, uh, it was already mentioned that Slovakia has uh, three main priorities. This is the media freedom that Slovakia is very actively advocating. That's the anti-corruption agenda. And that's the role of civil society. So civil society is seen both as the target of action, but also as an important contributor to all the uh, priority areas uh, that Slovakia has. Uh, of course, uh, civil society will also be the important watchdog that actually can monitor the government's implementation of the priorities and check what's been delivered and what's not. And maybe the final word is about the uh, U.S. role in the entire process. Definitely, it's much appreciated that the U.S. does not have an ambition to police the commitments and implementation of them. But where the U.S. can actually help and boost the image a little bit, and that goes in line with the uh, discussion about uh, Slovakia's role in the entire process and the leadership that Slovakia can deliver for the process, is uh, uh, U.S. presence in the region. Slovakia would definitely be uh, one of the countries that would be happy to, to host even President Biden in the region. And Slovaks do think that this presence would help with uh, both boosting the image of the entire process, but also boosting the public image of the United States and the democratic agenda in the region. Thank you so much, Alina, for this, this excellent and highly intriguing overview. I, I made some notices and I really promise that I will return with some provocative question to your points. But now uh, let's switch to, to Czechia. Uh, Pavlina, since entering power, the Czech government also made headlines with distancing itself from its autocratizing peers in the region. And there is also an obvious attempt to restore Czechia's positive image and perhaps also some parts of its democracy-centered Havelian foreign policy. Uh, what made that mean in the future terms uh, of, uh, for the summit uh, for democracy process? And, uh, and what are the Czech ambitions? And what can the transatlantic partners expect from, from the new government in Prague? Um, over to you, Pavlina. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, thank to, to GM, thanks to GM for, for inviting me and for organizing this event. Um, yeah, as it was already mentioned, the, the new Czech government is fairly new, and uh, regarding democracy, I would say it faces both external and internal challenges. Uh, as you just pointed out, uh, simultaneously, the government uh, tries very hard to distinguish itself from the previous uh, ANO government, uh, which, uh, as you probably know, has been uh, led by, by Andrei Popish and uh, who became infamous, among others, among other things, uh, because of his uh, conflict of interest, of his uh, media ownership, uh, etc. Um, let me start in the, with the Czech internal situation when it comes to democracy. Uh, because um, looking at the whole Central European region, uh, the, the state of democracy in the Czech Republic uh, might, might not seem uh, that bad compared to other countries. Um, at the same time, um, 
we are facing uh, political polarization and uh, social inequality, uh, declining trust in government. Um, all of these things were both uh, reflected and strengthened by the COVID pandemics. Um, society became uh, uh, more or becomes more vulnerable, uh, for example, towards disinformation. Um, what is thus needed is, uh, for, is to strengthen the social cohesion of the society, the resilience of the society, uh, among others, through education. And uh, I think uh, there is a space, or th th there is an, that's an area where, where, the, where the government should really uh, put their priority. Um, you already mentioned, Daniel, that the, the current Czech government, uh, led by Prime Minister Fiala, uh, is generally seen uh, very positively and uh, inspires great expectations uh, linked to their declarations about uh, commitments to democracy, uh, especially when it comes to um, foreign policy. Um, at the same time, we see that uh, the challenges that are I mean, the objective challenges that uh, the previous government was facing are not gone. We, uh, the pandemic is not gone. Uh, the inflation is at historical levels. The energy prices are, are at historical levels and that um, certainly will, will contribute to economic inequalities and uh, can further strengthen the distrust of uh, citizens towards the government. Um, the government has been in office for how long? Two months? almost. Um, I think that uh, currently at this moment it, it is uh, soon to tell uh, whether uh, or to what extent the government will uh, be will be able to to meet uh, their their commitments. Um, what we what, what I've already, what I've also uh, mentioned and would like to focus more on is the uh, cooperation or the role uh, of the civil society in the in the Czech Republic. Um, what we see, um, or the main, the main the main problems connected with uh, with the with the role of civil society in the Czech Republic is, um, um, for example, uh, the, um, the financial instability, uh, the um, the legal basis that is not uh, not really suitable for the civic society organizations to be financial, financially uh, stable. Uh, but um, perhaps what I would stress the most is the public discourse when it comes to uh, the NGOs, the NGO sector and, and civic, civil society institutions. Again, compared to the discourse in, uh, in other countries in the region of Central Europe, uh, the situation is not that grave, but still we see that uh, there are some political actors that tend to uh, criticize the civil sector and uh, tend to um, put in doubt the importance of, of these institutions in the democratic society. Um, so um, what, what we need to do is for political actors to really step up and uh, speak up for, for the importance of, uh, of uh, civil society in the, in the democratic uh, state. Uh, now, uh, let me focus on uh, on the foreign policy, uh, because it's the foreign policy, it's the area of foreign policy where the Czech, where the, where the current Czech, gov Czech government uh, has been very vocal about their intention to, uh, to spread democracy uh, around the world and uh, promote uh, democracy, human, human rights, uh, and uh, prioritiz prioritize prioritizing the uh, so-called transformation and development cooperation. Uh, this is all framed uh, as the legacy or continuation of the legacy of the first uh, Czech democratic president, uh, Václav Havel, um, which of course it's a, it's a good news and um, we, we, are, we, we are all happy to hear about these intentions um, in the context of the Czech foreign policy, which in the past year, past years, um, has been uh, to an extent uh, self-centered or the, the focus on the foreign policy has not been as big as the focus on, uh, on the domestic policy issues. Um, what we can expect or what, what we could have seen in the program declaration of the, um, of the current government uh, is that the government will focus on, uh, among others, fight, fight against uh, corruption, uh, supporting the freedom of media, freedom of speech, 
um, equal opportunities for civic participation and participation in politics, uh, of course, integrity of elections and support, support to uh, civil society and human rights uh, defenders. Again, at this moment, I think it's very uh, soon to tell uh, about whether these intentions will materialize and to what extent they will materialize. Um, for example, uh, there has been some there have been some cuts in the budget for humanitarian aid and bilateral development aid uh, by the current government. So um, let's see. At the same time, um, of course, this year is a big year for the Czech Republic as a member state of the European Union, because in the in the second uh, half of the year, the Czech Republic will hold the rotating presidency. Um, there have been rumors, or perhaps there are not rumors anymore, uh, that the current ad administration would like to uh, invite uh, Joe Biden to, uh, to a summit, to a US-EU summit in the framework of the presidency. And I think that uh, democracy and the cooperation on, on spreading democracy throughout the world uh, could be one of the topics uh, of the summit. And now looking uh, looking at this uh, region, um, or when we speak about the Central Europe, uh, I will admit that I tend to uh, focus on the on the Visegrad countries. So uh, just just want to just wanted to to uh, make that clear, uh, because um, obviously when we speak about democracy in relation to the region of Central Europe, we um, often think of the democracy decline in Poland and Hungary. But, uh, given everything that I have mentioned previously, um, I don't think we can expect that the current Czech government uh, will be very critical of the developments in both, the, in both of these countries. Um, we can see that um, there might be some political affiliations even before uh, between um, the the Civic Democrats, which is the main biggest party in the current Czech government, uh, and Fidesz in Hungary, and uh, law, uh, law and order in law and justice, sorry, <laughs> law and justice in uh, in Poland. Uh, yeah. So what can uh, what can the uh, Central Europe or what can specifically Czech Republic do for reinventing and reviving the Central Europe's democratic uh, image? Um, I think uh, that together with Slovakia, really one of the main tasks that we should focus on as, as the two countries is to make clear that uh, Central Europe is not a homogeneous region when it comes to um, democracy, not only when it comes to other things too, but, uh, but uh, democracy specifically. And uh, yeah, uh, that uh, we, we can, of course, uh, support uh, civil, civil, civil society organization and democracy initiatives in both uh, Hungary uh, and, uh, and Poland. Um, but um, yeah, I think that uh, this, I think that this, this uh, support and this cooperation can be, can be critical, but um, the main task actually is uh, to yeah, to make it clear that uh, uh, if you look at the at Central Europe, uh, it's it's not uh, one one region uh, in all aspects necessarily in all in all aspects necessarily. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pavlina, for for this overview, ladies and gentlemen. The Q and A is open. Please submit your question either via the Q and A function of Zoom or just simply send them uh, into the chat. And uh, and meanwhile, the questions are arriving. I would like to, to hammer on, on some of the questions which already uh, emerged and especially uh, the last points of, of Pavlina. Uh, so my first question uh, are focusing on, on this reinvigoration of the democratic image and perhaps we can also jump on, on the US role uh, in, uh, uh, in the Summit for Democracy process. But, but just let's remain at the perception of democracy in, in Central and Eastern Europe. So my first question would be whether it is really a kind of liability or, or a burden, according uh, to your understanding, for, uh, for the respective governments. Um, of course, the second question would be what is really central for, uh, for this event, whether you see a genuine opportunity 
that, uh, that the Summit for Democracy can contribute to a kind of revival of, uh, of, this, of the region's democratic perception. You could perhaps also add further thoughts what could contribute if, uh, if the Summit for Democracy not necessarily. And, uh, and my last question is really, really provocative, and it touches upon the last, uh, last phrases of, of Pavlina. Um, how far is this balancing act sustainable, especially in the case of Czechia and Slovakia, that on the one hand, it's a genuine interest of these governments to distance themselves from the autocratizing neighbors, but on the other hand, of course, maintaining good neighborhood relations is also an essential question. And the problem is that that, can, that tension can be a, a real challenge for Czech and Slovakian foreign policy very soon, not only due to the OSC asking member states and also EU member states to, to delegate election observers to, to Hungary, for example. But, uh, but how would, for example, the Czech and the Slovak governments uh, vote in the council if, for example, the European Commission is uh, suggesting sanctions against Poland and Hungary under the rule of law conditionality regulation? And whether it would be credible to, to keeping uh, the democratic credentials, if, for example, Czechia and, and Slovakia would vote against such a proposal, which is aiming at the protection of rule of law in, in, uh, in the European Union. I know that these are very challenging questions, and you are definitely not representing your, your governments. I am just simply interested in, in your insights. How far is this really a challenging balancing act for, for Central European countries? And uh, and I think I give you, uh, Alina and Pavlina, uh, a certain time to, uh, to consider uh, the answers, because for you, I think it's more challenging than for Vitis. So Vitis, please go ahead. OK, didn't expect that. Thanks. Uh, I, I think it's uh, a very important question. And I think that I try to touch upon a little bit on, on that. Uh, we need to be humble, obviously, about uh, the quality of democracy at home and work on it. But I think that the, our deficiencies uh, at home do not necessarily need to, uh, the, way, the way sometimes authoritarians do, like they pose this question, what about this, right? So, so we need to work on the deficiencies at home, but also like promote uh, and talk about uh, democracy and human rights uh, are beat at the OEC, Council of Europe, uh, the UN. Well, um, and uh, the same applies talking about uh, our neighbors uh, like Poland. Uh, I understand that there are certain difficulties, but uh, I brought the example of talking to Saakashvili government uh, as well. I think we need to learn from the mistakes back then. Uh, and uh, not make any calculations, you know, oh, this is like inconvenient. Well, that's what diplomacy for, right? We can communicate some sort of, some things more discreetly in our bilateral affairs, right? By saying, we'll support you there. But I mean, guys, if you are violating international norms, we would be voting the way we should be voting. There's... Uh, so, so, and uh, mm, I understand that it's much more complicated uh, when it comes to Hungary, uh, but uh, things uh, in Poland are not perfect uh, either. And, uh, and that's uh, why it's not an either or question. We should be taking care of uh, the quality of democracy at home because uh, it makes us vulnerable, like inside. Just uh, and also, we need to be very clear about the criteria for the membership uh, at the Euro Atlantic Community, be it uh, in the EU, be it uh, in NATO. Because just imagine if we have some transition countries, which mm, like might be 
used uh, as the train horse of some sort, uh, how would that affect the decision-making process within the Euro-Atlantic community? So it's uh, like, it's also a threat. Thus, as I've said, human rights, democracy, fundamental freedoms should be the guiding lines of uh, our, our foreign affairs, but also like uh, it shouldn't be an either or question. We should be also very vocal about the processes inside the EU. Uh, one way or another, like this is a battle between the authoritarian countries and democracies and the authoritarian countries would like to show democratic countries as weak, as the ones who have a lot of double standards. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's why it's of utmost importance also to have always a comparative approach, you know, to not dwell into this, what about is never ending stories, because, you know, when neighboring country like Belarus is torturing and killing people, and, you know, uh, like uh, then the official Minsk is kind of trying to mock uh, Lithuania regarding some protests and some uh, like uh, be protester who participated in the um, violent activity during the protests uh, of being detained. I mean, I think that there's nothing even to compare. So, 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 and that's why international institutions are created for. So, so we need to get return back this agenda beat at the OECE. Uh, I had lots of expectations in terms of the Swedish presidency because, well, it's Sweden, right? Uh, uh, and I think it's rather challenging, uh, going to be rather challenging for Poland, who is now at the presidency, to talk about uh, dem democratic standards uh, in the neighboring countries, especially since they have some issues at home. Thank you so much, Vitis, for these clear words. Uh, Alina, Pavlina, uh, who would I like can, to start? I can start. Uh, I totally agree with Vitis. It's not about saying that, okay, there is one floor, several flaws within our system, so we should give up and uh, uh, give up on democracy and uh, just you can sell with the fact that we don't do well. Not at all. I think it's a good thing that the citizens actually better governance, better and better governance uh, from the government in power and uh, will always be working on that. In terms of um, what's important, I think, for people is also the ability of the government or the democracy advocates to break it down what exactly it means for them and be consistent with implementation of these commitments. Um, also, in terms of the communication is important, and I want to, you to give one example that's uh, uh, widespread in the region, is uh, when we do the survey, we did an experiment. We asked the citizens the same question, whether you think that democracy as a system that relies on human rights and balance of power is good for your country, and people, 88% of people say yes. And then we asked the same question, but added one word. Do you think that liberal democracy, that is a system balanced on human rights and the balance of power, is good for your country? And uh, slightly over 50% of people say yes. So uh, there is this uh, preconception that the word liberal is almost like a swear word that shouldn't be used in public. And uh, citizens just uh, start associated, unfortunately, with something that's not particularly exciting or good for them. So it's important to choose practical examples rather than the terminology in communicating with people and be consistent in implementation of the commitments. And here I think Slovak uh, fight against corruption and uh, uh, a lot of anti-corruption investigation that's already been done under the current government is a good example of practical steps and measures that are being taken. In terms of the um, genuine opportunities, uh, and I'll connect it actually to York's question in the chat, uh, I do think that uh, this regional cooperation and ability to work cross borders is something that the summit can contribute with. I don't think that there are uh, too many initiatives in the region. Of course, there are smaller things here and there, but there's not too, much, too many platforms in the region where the governments, but also uh, civil society actors, journalists can build coalitions across the border. For example, there are certain cooperation and certain platforms in the region, uh, let's say Visegrad countries, but democracy is not really the thing that's being discussed in this platform. 
So uh, the summit itself can provide the opportunity to create some cross-border cooperation. And maybe that could be one of the ideas for the US or for the countries that take leadership is try to push more for cross-border initiatives as part of the commitments of the countries. I want to give one interesting example here, and that's why I also think that the Summit for Democracy is beautiful, uh, is uh, it's not just about the governments. We should also look at what uh, civil society and other independent actors are doing. Uh, in Slovakia, there is a media outlet that called Denikan, and it's a very interesting example because it's um, independent media that is surviving on fundraising and uh, um, subscriptions, and they're doing pretty well. And what are they doing now? They're opening a Hungarian language edition of the newspaper. Again, uh, completely uh, based on the uh, subscriptions and uh, fundraising among the subscribers. And why I think it's important because the um, first in Slovakia, the Hungarian minority is very substantial. There are a lot of issues uh, between the countries that need to be discussed. And uh, uh, of course, there is in the interest of Slovakia to also provide the languages of the minorities and the access to high quality media and journalists, uh, journalism, but that can easily spill over across the borders. And that could be something that is interesting for Hungarians from Hungary. And that leads me to the question about the balancing between Hungary and Poland. Of course, everybody knows that you don't choose your neighbors. You have to have uh, good and pragmatic relations with the neighbors. There are a lot of things of a practical nature that inevitably will need to be sorted out between the governments. That's why both Slovakia and I think Czech Republic, but Pavlina will know better, are very committed to stay within the Visegrad group because there are a lot of practicalities that have to be ironed out and that's a very efficient platform for cooperation. But also I think what's happening increasingly is that countries are trying to tackle also difficult issues. I'll give you one example. Recently, uh, there was uh, quite a heated situation between Slovakia and Hungary because the Hungarian government was buying land in Slovakia. And uh, that caused rather tense diplomatic exchange between the countries uh, with the involvement of wide spectrum of actors. In the end, the issue was resolved, uh, maybe temporarily, maybe not forever, but uh, there were pragmatic steps that were made forward and uh, the countries found a solution. So I do think that in many ways, difficult issues can be tackled between the countries if there is a consorted diplomatic effort and uh, willingness to look for constructive solutions. And so in terms of the um, uh, issues concerning the um, democracy voting within the European Union structures, today in the morning there was a ruling by the ECG that uh, rejected the um, claim of the Hungary and Poland. So I think uh, Slovakia would respect the ruling of the ECG and try to stick with the ECG decisions rather than trying to find some political voting process. Thank you so much, Alina. Pavlina. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, when, when I when I mentioned that we cannot really expect from the Czech government to be very critical towards its neighbors when it comes to democracy, um, I was of course speaking about government, but they, there are other actors that can could it could be instrumental in. Uh, uh, in the process of the summit of democracy, and as uh, Alena uh, mentioned, uh, there is a space for for cooperation among other actors like civil society organizations in the regional scope or uh, journalists, um, and um, I think that is an area where uh, the summit could and, and the the U.S. support perhaps uh, could be uh, very 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 successful. Um, other than that, um, how could the, could the, the image of, of the region be re, 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 revived or reinvented in the framework of the summit? Um, I think that it also, to a great extent, uh, great extent uh, depends on the level of engagement uh, when it comes to, to the Czech Republic and uh, the uh, the level of ownership uh, when it comes to the political actors here whether the leading political actors will be willing to really be uh, loud and vocal about the importance of first democracy itself, but then also about other, about our, is the Czech Republic's involvement um, in the process. I would really like to see that. 
uh, I haven't seen that yet, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, we still have, uh, we still have time. Um, on the issue of uh, the sustainability of, uh, of the Czech and Slovak positions in the framework of the V4 regarding the, the issues of, of democracy and uh, the voting, possible voting uh, in the council. Uh, yeah, um, I think um, speaking about the Czech Republic, when such a thing would be, uh, when there would be a prospect that such a thing would uh, would really happen, uh, first we could expect a heated political discussion in the Czech Republic, because uh, the Visegrad group itself has become sort of a symbol in Czech in the Czech foreign policy uh, discussions, and people are uh, really. Um, on one side, they are very, very critical towards Visegrad, suggesting that the Czech Republic should leave. Uh, the others, on the other hand, are very protective of the Visegrad group, claiming that it's one of the most important poli uh, political alliances that the Czech Republic has. Um, if there was a situation where the Czech Republic should decide whether or not it would uh, vote in the European Union in that or, or other way, uh, I think that uh, the Czech discussion would be would be very very intense um and i can't at this moment i can't really tell what the what the result would be what i would uh, what i would uh guess is that uh, uh the czech republic would would back the eu institutions but wouldn't be very very loud about it um potentially i also would like to or the further question related to, to Jörg's one uh, with regard to the potential regional cooperation formats uh, based on, on the national commitments. Uh, we have had one player which was more or less completely absent from, uh, from this summit, and that was the European Union. Uh, from a former perspective, we, we all know the reasons very well. Uh, one EU member state blocked or vetoed the joint position. But I think it was still much more interesting what happened after that. Nothing. There was not really a, an, an EU ambition to try to find a way out from uh, uh, from this uh, from this blockade. And uh, and one main political reason could be that, that certain big European countries were rather reluctant from the very beginning and supported this whole process uh, only very lukewarmly because they they more or less don't hundred percently share the u.s approach to uh to the thematization of the of the democracy agenda there there were, was a huge understanding for this blockade in many member states because because they shared the concern that the united states shouldn't pinpoint or finger point to to eu countries whether they are democratic enough or not uh, do you think that perhaps a side of, of regional cooperation formats, the European Union should perhaps play a more engaged role in the later stages uh, of, uh, uh, of the Summit for Democracy process? Or perhaps just the contrary, because the current elevated position of Lithuania, Slovakia, or the Czech Republic ultimately is built on the fact that, that these countries are highly engaged partners of the United States in this exercise, while uh, the overall support in the European Union is, uh, is definitely lower. Uh, I don't know, Jonathan, would you like to, uh, to be I the, just wanted, the first I just wanted to I just want to add on top of this, too, that yeah. particular question, maybe for Pavlina, too, is, uh, is the upcoming Czech presidency I think there's more than one way for the U.S. and EU to cooperate since the EU and the U.S. are the two largest providers of democracy assistance globally. But the Czech presidency is, um, is starts in the summer. There, that's when there's an expected to be a U.S.-EU summit. And just wondering, and my what I'm hearing through the grapevine is perhaps this may be a good opportunity to actually insert this, uh, the democracy issue 
you know, uh, squarely in, in the agreements uh, between the United States and the EU. And so I just wanted to, I, I was, it was less of a commentary, more of I wanted to ask whether you think um, Prague is going to make democracy a priority, one for its presidency, but it's sort of building on what Daniel has mentioned, um, the fact that the EU, which was there, but in a sort of, in a, I think not in the way that its leadership wanted to be there. So I think that's maybe there's a difference between one member state or maybe two that maybe didn't want the EU versus the EU wanting to be there. But maybe just asking about the Czech presidency and if there's an opportunity there, because I'm hearing that 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 might be a good opportunity to really raise the level of EU engagement. Thank you. Sorry to jump in, but I thought it would be worthwhile to. Thank you, Jonathan, for the great question. And Pavlina, you have the floor. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, actually, I think that the the summit, which I hope is is going to going to happen, um, will be uh, an opportunity, or will be taken as the as the Czech Republic um, will be will be taken by the Czech Republic as an opportunity to to raise uh, the issue of democracy and cooperation in the field of democracy with, between the the EU and the US or incorporating the, the issue, uh, the topic into the, um, into the program of the summit. Um, but um, it's, not, uh, it's not clear yet whether the summit will or will not happen. Uh, as, for the, as for democracy as a priority for the Czech presidency, um, I will perhaps start from slightly another angle because um, the cooperation of the EU with the, the countries of Eastern Partnership has been, one of, has been one of the priorities of the Czech foreign policy and is also, be, uh, is, is also going to be a priority for the Czech presidency. And of course, uh, contributing to democracy building in these countries and uh, capacity building and strengthening democracy uh, standards, let's say uh will uh, definitely be a part of of uh what the czech republic and the european union uh will or what the czech republic thinks that the european union should really uh, focus on in these countries is uh, d does that uh, uh answer your question Thank you, Pavlina. And, uh, and could you perhaps also address the question uh, whether the European Union could perhaps play a more engaged role uh, in the later stages of, of the summit? Whether you see there are an opportunity for that, whether that could be a goal or ambition of Central European countries, um, or, uh, or whether the main emphasis will remain both on, on the domestic commitments on the one hand and uh, and that these commitments are related somehow to the bilateral relations with the United States. I really feel like today among uh, the, the speakers here, I'm the most negative one, uh, but uh, I relate. Perhaps that um, means that they're the most realistic as well. <laughs> yeah, perhaps it does have something to do with the Czech mentality, right? Um, anyway, uh, I don't really have, um, oh, look, looking at the, um, European Union at its current state and uh, the very, very obvious domestic issues it has to resolve among its member states um, when it comes to democracy um, and questions connected to democracy. Um, I don't really hold, uh, hold high hopes for the EU to, um, be, to be even able to uh, contribute uh, to a very large extent, but um, I mean, over to the others, please. Uh, um, yeah, have, have expressed different uh, different opinions. Thank you so much, Pavlina. With this, over to you. Thank you. Um, I think that talking about democracy is all right, but it's not enough. I mean, we need to practice. We need to uh, do more by doing. And then you have more confidence, right? It's like looking to the, uh, like, I don't know, cargo of one kilos and talking whether we are able to live that or not, uh, it's not gonna work. You know, we need to practice, train and make it happen. So so I think that that uh, is uh, like 
why I've told that it cannot only be a philosophical debate, but we need to have confidence. Uh, and uh, I think that what happened again, I will stress this uh, miracle of 2020 in Belarus that was so unexpected by uh, a lot of like people and politicians in the, the in, in in neighboring countries that uh, and I think that it should have inspired us that there is a demand for that uh, but also it's a litmus paper for everyone like uh, for every neighbor for Brussels for like uh, for OSCE and other international forests because uh, if we are unable to address the challenge of Belarus, which is not the strongest uh, authoritarian country, then we have a problem with uh, like human rights and, democ and democratic agenda in international affairs. And, and uh, so, so um, I think that uh, like still like there's uh, the office of Svetlana Tikhanovska, hundreds of journalists and thousands of civic activists in the neighboring countries in the Czech Republic, uh, but like Lithuania, Poland, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, we need to work with them and have it uh, and see what's happening in Belarus, not only from the geopolitical perspective, but also from the like the democratic agenda because what is happening now in ukraine like all these tensions around and the military conversations primarily right i wonder if like if the like kremlin is moving the troops uh, from the border with ukraine and some of the military troops stay in belarus would that be a concern for the EU or for your Atlantic community? Would that be sanctioned? Wouldn't it be a soft occupation without any single shot without, and you know, everyone was like, oh, well, but, but it was under the Kremlin's influence one way or another. And I think that that entire like uh, story around Ukraine also served as a huge distraction from this agenda. What is happening inside Belarus? like why like uh, we couldn't address all these uh, like terror and the human rights abuses there so uh, and to address your question also i think that there are many many formats like for lithuania obviously bilateral conversations with poland but also the baltic format the nordic formats various nordic baltic eight uh, like with nordic countries but also including the uh, the UK and I think that the including bringing back United Kingdom is like of uh, utmost importance here and we can do it by resolution statements but as I mentioned I think practice is much more important here and like be it on sanctions be it on regional initiatives be it on visits say now to Kiev and Ukraine showing the solidarity there there are different levels interparliamentary and like uh, when politicians are doing that MFAs are doing that presidents are doing that I am very hopeful I see a lot of that I think that we need a little bit more consolidated effort and again not hide behind the behind the back of Brussels saying or mocking sometimes the way Kremlin does that Brussels is always concerned you know well Brussels is uh, like the group of various EU capitals and if we don't have uh, confidence and determination at home Brussels will not have it certainly so it's on us and I think that leading by example like encouraging others is really what we should and I hope Lithuania is doing that. Thank you so much Vitis. Alina you have the floor. Uh, I will definitely add the European Union to the summit. In general, I think the more actors who take part, the better. Uh, but also uh, what Slovakia rightly and smartly did in its commitments, they went through uh, different EU regulations and recommendations in the area of democracy and the, in the areas of priorities of Slovakia and added them as part of their commitment, saying that we will uh, implement these recommendations by the EU or this framework that the EU suggests. So I think this kind of uh, coordination of all the important work that's done at the EU level and factoring it in into the work of the summit definitely helps for sure. And uh, uh, one quick word about the role of the US in democracy promotion in the region. Probably uh, there is no perfect solution because I remember when Trump was president, 
there was a lot of criticism for, of the United States for the fact that the U.S. administration was rewarding the uh, wrong types of behavior. And uh, uh, the countries in the region were not particularly happy, but also the EU wasn't particularly happy that Trump had uh, rather good relations with the uh, Polish president, with the Hungarian president uh, and prime minister, and uh, uh, countries like Slovakia or other countries were wondering whether um, maybe they should be also higher on the agenda of the U.S. administration. So some of this desire to re-engage with the U.S. is also in a way a payback for the Trump year and uh, an attempt to make sure that uh, now the U.S. shows the support also to the uh, actors who are trying to boost their democratic credentials. Thank you, Alina, for this excellent and, and highly important uh, point. I think we are approaching the end of our webinar. And uh, thank you for this, this highly intriguing and, and excellent discussion. We have time for a final round. What can be also a kind of closing words uh, from, from all of your end? And, and my question would be, uh, what would be your recommendations? Uh, both for the organizers that the second edition uh, of the summit could be really an improved version and a more effective in fulfilling of their goals. Uh, what would be the most important points which should be def definitely paid attention to? And uh, what would be your recommendations to your own national governments? In the case of Jonathan, this two are identical. <laughs> so perhaps you have the, the easiest job in this regard. Uh, could you start with the answer? Yeah, and, and thank you for, for all these, uh, both observations and, and, and already some, we already heard some recommendations. Uh, one thing that I know that, that civil society is doing in, in the United States already uh, with the summit in the year of action um, groups have already uh, gotten together, uh, have written directly to the administration laying out what, uh, what civil society think tanks and others hope the administration will do in this year of action in the lead up to the second summit for democracy. It would be good in countries, specifically given that the recommendation, the commitments are out to lay out these, uh, lay out uh, what civil society uh, and also uh, others would like to see the governments do to meet these commitments. And so I just, one recommendation I have, I thought was helpful here, uh, GMF, uh, Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, others signed on to these, uh, these letters to, to the Biden administration. We are even, you know, the United States faces the same challenges domestically. Uh, it may not be apples to apples, but we also have a destabilized uh, domestic uh, situation politically. Um, and so we need to do our work in the United States just as much as whether you're in Slovakia or Lithuania uh, or, you know, in the Czech Republic. So it, to me, getting that right. And then on the external part is I, I do think the U.S.-EU connection is critically important. One of the weaknesses has always been in the transatlantic relationship is you have strong pillars for political engagement, strong for security through NATO, but development cooperation and democracy support and cooperation has always been the weakest leg of that pillar. And, and trust me, others that have been in the US government have tried to strengthen that pillar. Um, and we, we did make some strides, I think, during the, the Obama administration, but it wasn't enough. And so when you hear, I heard some comments saying, hey, there doesn't seem to be a real strategy, whether it's in Eastern Europe you know, or you know, in Central Europe, that's true. There isn't, and, and there hasn't been. So, you know, creating some sort of mechanism to strengthen that development partnership, that democracy partnership is really critical. And again, thank you for, you know, to hearing from all three of you. Um, this administration I know in Washington is really deeply committed to these issues, but it's not just about democracy. Uh, and it's with the vision of the United States. It's, it's, it's your vision, it's civil society, other key actors, cities, local actors, uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you today. Thank you, Jonathan, for, for the very specific recommendations and, uh, and this excellent thoughts. Uh, Alina, would you mind to, to continue? Uh, I would highlight 
four or five uh, priorities that I think would help. Uh, first, uh, it's the question that Jörg actually raised. I think it's important to highlight also cross-country initiatives and cross-country projects that are being implemented, not just between the governments, but between other actors, as well, be it the uh, local municipalities or civil society or media. Second, uh, I do think it's important to highlight successes and celebrate the achievements as well. Third, I would also recommend having regional spins off uh, of uh, the summit that can be done at the regional level in cooperation with a much broader set of actors. Um, for me, it would be interesting to see also the commitments of the civil society. Civil society is part of the process, but it would be probably beneficial to also try to uh, develop similar strategies that the government has at the level of civil society and try to think what we can do and what we ourselves commit to. And finally, uh, given especially this year and the situation uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, the uh, consolidated effort to uh, have this external dimension of democracy and to see what we can collectively do to help our Eastern European uh, colleagues uh, could be also beneficial for sustaining democracy in the region and in the United States. Uh, thank you so much, Alina. And uh, I think on the part of GMF, I can only underline that if, if there will be a, a joint thinking, uh, what sort of commitments could be could be undertaken by civil society organizations? We would be happy to be that uh, that project because that's uh, that's a really interesting and and very very innovative approach to that. So it would be definitely worth to uh, to return to this idea uh, in the later stages. With this, over to you. Thank you. Um... Well, I'm optimistic, really. If someone 10 years ago like, would have told me that NATO is going to discuss you know, the center for democracy or something, I would say like, well, no, not really. And now uh, at least on the like, parliamentarian level, they are like, discussing the idea of the center for democratic resilience. And I think that, that that's something which shows that it's getting there to the national security agenda too. Uh, on the more like practical level, what needs to be done, I think that like whatever we feel confident, like we need to do it. We need to like, uh, like we need to practice it as much as possible. But if I may add something to this, I think that the process is also very important. I'm communicating that to Lithuanian authorities too, whenever I can. Like we need to break the echo chambers. Like when politicians are meeting only politicians so, or civil society is meeting only the... Usually when you have a big, big conference, what you have is politicians invite the opposition leaders. They speak to politicians. Everyone wants to speak, uh, you know, don't not, not necessarily have lots to say, right? Uh, uh, much uh, to a lesser extent, they are eager to listen when the third or the fourth panel of the civil society comes up, right? Then the, all the politicians are gone already. And I think that's bad, you know, at best they would invite some representatives of expert community. And I think is of critical importance to listen to civil society representatives, to the independent media, to human rights defenders, and see what's really not functioning or what's functioning well, right? So to break these uh, echo chambers, uh, and I think that we will find more synergies and, uh, and uh, we will be able to address some of the gaps which are there even in the democratic countries. Thank you, Vitas. And I think that could be also a critical recommendation for potential future side events organized by Central and Eastern European countries that this mixed composition should be taken very much into consideration and, uh, and allow not only politicians and diplomats to exchange among uh, or, or themselves, but, but also with, with civil society representatives and, and experts and, and think tankers. Pavlina, you really have the, uh, the closing words. Please go ahead. Thank you, no pressure. <laughs> Uh, well, a recommendation uh, to, towards the organizers for me would be to focus on uh, delivering concrete specific uh, steps that can be evaluated and, uh, so to speak, move beyond, uh, beyond uh, 
the, the buzzword uh, buzzwords. Uh, also, I would think um, it would be good to uh, keep the the mechanism or keep the, the uh, summit for democracy to a certain extent as a standing mechanism or uh, some mechanism for consultations among uh, the uh, act, the uh, participating actors. Um, a lot of important points have already been raised. Uh, perhaps what I would like to emphasize is, um, is the importance of education when we want to build democracy and contribute to the democracy development. Uh, we should focus on really building it from the ground, uh, which means that uh, the focus on education should be uh, should be great. Um, finally, the recommendations for the Czech Republic. Um, first, um, I wouldn't say it's a recommendation, perhaps it's an expectation from, from my side um, to uh, support the, the declarations uh, of the current Czech government uh, with, uh, with action so that we uh, see that uh, they really are serious. And um, of course, as has been mentioned a couple of times during this discussion, uh, to uh, somehow somewhat link the summit uh, for democracy process with the Czech presidency and to, to really uh, initiate uh, discussions uh, and, and put the priority uh, on the issue of democracy in the framework of the Czech presidency. Thank you so much, Pavlina, and uh, especially many thanks for, for underlining the importance of the missing item of democracy education, which is, which is definitely uh, a subject where there is room for improvement in nearly all Central and Eastern European countries. But first of all, I would like to say a big thank you for all for sharing your insights with us and, uh, and for this lively conversation. Thank you for joining this today webinar. And, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, also many thanks for you for being with us today. Uh, have a nice day and hopefully see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.